Hey there, folks. Mike McDonald here from uh, Mayday Flight uh, Tutoring. I'm a flight instructor at the Calgary Flying Club in Canada. When I'm not uh, elsewhere, like right now in Germany, I've taken a bit of a break during this COVID season. Although I could be working, I decided to go home with my wife, who lives in Germany, and uh, enjoy the lifestyle of Berlin. Uh, during that time I've been here, I did my first uh, flight instructor re refresher course, and I did it online with a really good company, uh, Aviation Solutions, based in uh, Toronto or the Ontario, Toronto area. It was online Zoom refresher course, and it was super interesting. Um, in my opinion, it was better than just simply doing another flight instructor test. Um, I think it was more comprehensive, involving, and thought-provoking. And uh, in thinking about what I was going to talk about next online here, um, I, uh, I have some interest in discussing the flight, uh, the stall spin awareness guide. That's a publication from Transport Canada, which you can get online if you just simply type Transport Canada stall spin awareness guide. And uh, the whole concept of why we teach stalls and spins and how a flight instructor would use this guide in preparation of lessons and in preparing the student for uh, flight lessons, theory and practical, as well as how a flight instructor uh, like myself or others might approach the subject of stalls and spins. We had a, an inspector from the Ontario region of Transport Canada uh, talk to us during the refresher course, and uh, she... Uh, had some pretty interesting uh, things to say about why we teach stalls, how we teach stalls and spins, and and uh, what the results can be. And uh, and so the, the, the stall spin awareness guide plays fairly strongly into that and reflects, I think reflects the, uh, how would you call it, the, uh, the position of Transport Canada from a safety standpoint for future pilots, private and commercial pilots. Um, and it's a very interesting subject. Um, those of you who have already begun flight training after a few lessons would have found yourself in a situation where the instructor would, uh, after teaching range and endurance and then slow flight, the next lesson would be about stalls and stalls. Uh, this is before spins. Uh, and of course, as a flight instructor, of course, during the preparatory ground instruction, we would query the student as to why we teach this at all. Um, of course, the obvious answer is to teach the student how to, how to prevent being in a scenario where the airplane would stall, um, which can have dire consequences, consequences to the flight. Uh, the perspective of the Transport Canada inspector, which I, I largely agree with, is that in most scenarios, when a stall could occur, it's going to happen low to the ground, within a couple of hundred feet of the ground. So um, if an airplane is stalled at that height, the chances are very slim that it's going to recover before crashing. So, um, so therefore, we teach stall recovery, but the emphasis really probably should be on stall prevention. And I think that there's a bit of a culture in flight training where that's forgotten. Um, I think I've been guilty of that as well. Um, and uh, so I wanna just clear up some misconceptions about stalling. First of all, um, as you know, from flight theory, an airplane can stall in any attitude and at any speed, because how is it that a wing stalls, right? It's angle of attack, the angle of attack of the wing or the cord, mean cord line of the wing to the relative airflow. So once the angle of attack goes beyond the critical angle of attack, then very little lift is produced by the wing. It does still produce some lift and the airplane falls. Basically gravity takes over. Um, so we teach stalls at, a, at what we consider to be a safe altitude, you know, above 2000 feet AGL. So one should, recover before 2,000 feet above the ground. And that's an, a safe environment to teach stalling, but it's not a realistic environment in terms of where stalls occur. Um, 
where stalls have occurred in the history of aviation. As I said earlier, they happen close to the ground. Uh, scenarios like in the climb out from uh, an airport on a hot, high altitude, humid day with an airplane overloaded, um, on uh, base, uh, base to final turn, that's a very common scenario, um, in the overshoot, um, in an aborted landing. At times when the airplane's at a, already at a high angle of attack, uh, the wing is at a, already at a high, high angle of attack, and the workload on the pilot is fairly strong, and all of those elements are sort of piling upon, piling upon the pilot. Um, so the Stall Spin Awareness Guide is a really great uh, publication to read, and it describes in fairly good detail uh, the different types of, types of scenarios that can occur. And it's emphasized quite strongly that we as flight instructors should early on um, let you know about the Stall Spin Awareness Guide and use that as a template for learning. So I have it here on my computer and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of it. And those of you who have never seen it, I really urge you to have a look at it. Um, so yeah, so the Stall Spin Awareness Guide here, let me just get it, get it up here. It's not a big document, it's only 19 pages. Uh, it starts with the types of stalls, uh, goes on to stall recovery, what secondary stalls are, talks about cross-controlled stalls, which is a, a little understood subject, and it goes into spins, the primary cause, spin recovery, and then uh, what I think is interesting is scenario-based training, which I think we as instructors really need to uh, take command of. Talks about distractions, uh, stall training, and then the different types of stalls that you can have, departure stalls, arrival stalls, engine failure after takeoff, accelerated stalls, uh, distractions with spin training, and then scenarios. So I'm not going to go through the whole document, but I'm just going to highlight some, some key parts of the document. Um, let's just start at the beginning here. Uh, stalls, types of stalls. So stalls can be practiced both with and without power. And of course, you do that in your flight training. Stalls should be practiced to familiarize the student with the aircraft's particular stall characteristics without putting the aircraft into a potentially dangerous condition. So up high above 2,000 feet, recovery height. And then it describes three different types. The departure stalls, which are considered to be power on stalls because you're departing an airport are practiced to simulate takeoff and climb out conditions and configuration. Many stall spin accidents have occurred during these phases of flights, as I said, particularly during overshoots. A causal factor in such accidents has been the pilot's failure to maintain positive pitch control due to a high nose trim setting or premature flap retraction. Failure to maintain positive control during short field takeoffs has also contributed towards accidents. So there's your departure stalls. Rival stalls too, they can be classified as your power off stall or reduced power stall. Uh, they're practiced to simulate normal approach to landing conditions and configuration. Simulations should also be practiced at reduced power settings consistent with the approach requirements of the particular training aircraft. Many stall spin accidents have occurred in situations such as cross controlled turns from base leg to final. Uh, which is basically a skidding and then trying to lift the wing. So a slipping, uh, skidding or a slipping turn and then trying to lift a wing with a high angle of attack and some turning moment on the go there. Attempting to recover from a high sink rate on final approach uh, by using an increased pitch attitude. Oh, pardon me for a second. I don't know if you heard that, but my German's really bad. Okay, so where was I? Um, yeah, so on final approach by using an increased pitch attitude and improper airspeed control on final approach or in other segments of the traffic pattern. So somewhere in the circuit. Now, accelerate, accelerated stalls are a little bit of a different animal. And it says here, they can occur at higher than normal airspeeds during abrupt or excessive control applications. These stalls may occur in steep turns, that's common, uh, pull-ups and other abrupt changes in flight. For these reasons, accelerated stalls usually are more severe than unaccelerated stalls and are often unexpected. Okay, so the classic scenario there is when you're 
when you're uh, crop dusting your friend's house, okay, not actually crop dusting, but you're showing off in the steep turn, maybe at 200 feet, pulling hard, going to an accelerator stall, stall spin into the house, into the backyard. So um, what it says here, I'll just go on with the stall recovery. Like I say, I'm just doing the main points here. Uh, the key factor for stall recovery is regaining positive control of the airplane by reducing angle of attack. At the first indication of a stall, the, the wing angle of attack must be decreased to allow the wings to regain lift. Every aircraft in upright flight may require a different amount of forward uh, pressure to regain lift. It should be noted that too much forward pressure, pressure could hinder recovery by imposing negative load on the wing. I've had that happen by students. Uh, the next step in recovering from a stall is to apply smoothly maximum allow allowable power to increase the airspeed and minimum loss of altitude. Uh, as airspeed increases and the recovery is completed, power should then be adjusted back to normal uh, for the desired flight condition. Straight and level flight should then be established with full coordinated use of controls. The airspeed indicator, uh, if installed, should never be allowed to reach their high speed red lines. So the, either your TAC or your airspeed indicator. Um, in secondary stalls, if recovery is not made properly, so if you do recover from a stall not properly, a secondary stall or a spin may result, which is caused by attempting to hasten the completion of stall recovery before the aircraft airplane has regained sufficient flying speed. So in this scenario, uh, perhaps like a classic scenario is when we're teaching spin uh, recovery after you've used opposite rudder to stop the spinning, and then reduce the angle of attack by forward pressure on the control column. Now the airplane's in a dive. And then if you were to pull back too abruptly um, before the airplane gains sufficient, sufficient speed, um, you'd hear the uh, angle of attack indicator, the, the, the kazoo beep, and that would indicate that you're into a secondary stall. Or just pulling too abruptly out of the dive would, could create the same scenario. Okay. Now here's an interesting one, okay? This is something that's not, uh, in, at least in my experience, hasn't been often taught. Um, it's cross-controlled stalls. Students are taught to avoid steeply banked turns at low altitude, yes. If you overshoot the extended center line on a turn from base to final, so let's imagine a left-hand circuit. You're on, here's the runway, you're on downwind, now you're on base. Now imagine if you, if say maybe you had a little bit of a crosswind from, from the left, okay, so you're landing this way, and you find yourself overshooting the line of final approach, okay? Now, one of the things that you, that an inexperienced pilot may do is to apply left rudder to cant the airplane or to yaw the airplane into a turn. Of course, that's going to drop the wing, okay? Now, already... Yes, you have less power at this point. You're in a descent configuration. You probably have flaps. And um, you have this left turn uh, moment on the go. Okay, so a yaw moment. Okay. Now, if the left-hand wing drops and you're trying, to get, you're trying to get back into the center line and the left-hand wing drops and you've got the yaw, the urge would be to lift that wing with aileron. But see, that left-hand wing is already at a high ang higher angle of attack. So as soon as you put, uh, input right aileron in that scenario, then what you're doing is you're actually increasing the camber of the wing and you're actually cre creating um, a higher angle of attack. So rather than lifting the wing, the wing will drop further. And of course that would be an incipient spin. Now, of course, if this happens at 150, 200 or 500 feet above the ground, you're not going to recover from that. If you get into a full-on spin in that base to final turn, um, then it's not going to be recoverable. So, which brings up the whole question, why do we teach full-on spin training in the first place? Um, I, I think, and, and definitely Transport Canada believes that we should be focusing on the prevention of the conditions that would lead to a stall or a spin, okay? Um, so anyways, they go on to say that, uh, the skidding turn tends to make the nose drop requiring back pressure, which increases the angle of attack. Then of course you want to use, you've got the, you've got the, you're pulling back in the control column, you get your left foot in and then right aileron, 
increases the angle of attack to the left wing, which actually makes it stall even more or makes it go into a full stall. And then the airplane dips into a spin. Okay. Um, a top rudder stall or over the top stall can occur when the air, airplane is slipping. Okay. This airplane should roll towards the higher wing at the point of the stall. Okay. So that's less common. If you're going to, if you're going to either slip or skid, uh, a slip is always the uh, better scenario, but we don't tend to slip in turns uh, too low to the ground. And they are generally a safer maneuver to make. A skid is never really a safe maneuver. Okay, a skid is like that classic Dukes of, Dukes of Hazard where the tail of the vehicle's going in the direction of the turn and the ass is coming around outside of the turn. That's a, that's a skid, and it's pretty useless unless you're doing some sort of an aerobatic maneuver that's set up with a skid. Um, so a spin, and you know this, I'm sure, in a small airplane is controlled or, or is a controlled or hopefully controlled or uncontrolled maneuver in which the airplane descends in a helical path while flying stalled in a stalled condition, a high angle of attack, uh, greater than the angle of maximum lift. So spins result from aggravated stalls in uncoordinated flight, like that classic base to final turn. In an aggravated stall, one wing will drop before the other and the nose will yaw in the direction of the low wing. If the stall does not occur, a spin cannot occur, okay? Now a spin needs that stalling condition first. So a spin comes from a stall, all right? An incipient spin is that portion of a spin from the time the airplane stalls and rotation starts until it becomes fully developed. Um, a, uh, an incipient spin is not allowed to develop into a fully developed spin is commonly used, uh, commonly used to introduce spins in spin training and spin recovery techniques. A fully developed spins occurs when the aircraft, aircraft angular rotation rates, airspeed and vertical speed have become stabilized from turn to turn in a flight plat, path that is close to vertical. So it's pitching, it's yawing and it's rolling, but it's consistent. Um, I'm not gonna go into flat spins. It's a little bit different. Uh, if you want to uh, see a, a wild flat spin, or at least a recreation of a wild flat spin, then uh, there's a great Tom Wolf movie, The Right Stuff, with Chuck Yeager in the F-104 Widowmaker classic scene. Towards the end of the movie, he gets that aircraft into a flat spin. So uh, basically, a spin is caused by uh, aggressive yaw in one direction or the other, um, and one wing exceeding the critical angle of attack, okay? So generally, it's pretty uh, ridiculous to get yourself into a spin scenario or even a stall scenario, although, although it, the accident statistics do prove that these occur. Um, oftentimes, um, a spin is incipient during that fatal portion of a stall, okay? So it's a natural characteristic of uncoordinated flight during the stall condition or the stall condition that's developing okay so at any rate this document kind of describes you know these types of uh, flight conditions that are adverse to your life or at least to the health of your airplane okay so then it goes on to talk about scenario based training okay um, and uh, that's where us as instructors really come in I mean you know I guess I have been just as guilty as other instructors of saying, okay, today we're going to do stall training. Yeah, we talk about uh, in the preparatory ground instruction, I mean, what creates a stall, how we avoid a stall. Um, but in the air, after doing the hazel check, height, area, security, engine, um, and uh, all that good stuff, um, and look out, you know, then, okay, you know, we demonstrate a stall, then we get the student to practice a stall, then we help refine that training. Uh, but I think it's probably better if us as instructors look at scenario-based type training. Like, for example, there's no reason why we couldn't initiate an overshoot at 3,000 feet AGL and then show how a stall can develop from uh, improper application of controls during an overshoot. Okay, so it's perfectly possible to be in the air for an instructor to say, okay, let's, let's set ourselves up for a 20-degree flap uh, partial power landing, um, and oh, here comes a deer on the runway, overshoot, and then 
show how an improper overshoot can lead to a stall. Okay, so that's basically scenario-based training. So it talks about distractions, okay? And uh, distractions are probably the main uh, reason why people get into a stall, stall uh, scenario. Distractions and also just poor airmanship. Uh, a classic example is, you know, some fly in some place, and I know of where these have happened, and uh, hot, very hot day and humid and uh, potentially maybe even also a high uh, density altitude, uh, an overloaded airplane with two fat guys, you know, or, or three people when there really should, there should only be two or not paying attention to the center of gravity and to the, ma the maximum gross rate weight limits, attempt to take off from a, say, a soft or a rough field, like a tall grassy field, and manage to get in the ground effect. And then as they try to come out of ground effect, as the trees are coming closer and closer, realize that they're not gonna clear the trees and then resort to increasing the angle of attack by increasing back pressure, there's not enough power. And uh, two things are either gonna happen is that the airplane managed to stay wings level and just mushes into the trees, or the angle of attack reaches that point at which, um, at which the wings uh, cannot carry the weight of the airplane, and then the airplane nose drops. If the CFG is in the normal rain, the nose will drop, and potentially a wing will start to drop, and they auger in, and it's deadly. This happened with a uh, Lake Buccaneer in Stanley, Nova Scotia, oh, back in the early 2000s, and that was exactly the scenario. It was a hot day. It was a rough field, uh, not, uh, not, not much more than 2,000 feet long, Two big, three people, all of them heavy. Um, and that's exactly what I described is exactly what happened. And uh, I think two of them died and, and one of them survived. Um, so distractions, okay? Improper airspeed management resulting in a stall or spin is most likely to occur when the pilot is distracted. Poor weather, sickness, or intermittent equipment malfunctions can result in the pilot focusing on tasks secondary to flying the airplane. Always fly the airplane. Fly the airplane first. Aviate, number one. Navigate, number two. Communicate, number three. Emergencies such as engine failures and fires can cause really strong distractions uh, at critical times, such as maneuvering for landing or takeoff or an overshoot. Okay, so, um, so that's kind of like just a, a rough sort of... Uh, a rough sort of uh, recital of this document, which isn't very long anyway. Um, and just going back to scenarios, like here's a, here's a scenario that they give you. Uh, a reduced power setting can be used to simulate high density altitude. Okay, so I'll make it a scenario base. Uh, during a departure or overshoot, steep climb or a steep climbing turn. So while say avoiding obstacles or avoiding birds or other aircraft are showing off or caught in a downdraft or wing contamination or distraction resulting in airspeed decay. So an instructor can actually, can actually play out a scenario like that at a safe altitude. And it sort of gives you a context that it takes it from the abstract to the real. And I think as instructors, we should be doing that as much as possible. You know, take things from the abstract and make them real. Um, it has been said, and it was said at the, my flight refresher training by the Transport Canada inspector, and I totally agree with this, that often instructors will, um, after doing the slow flight uh, demonstration, lesson and demonstration, moving on to stalls, will just allow the student or during the demonstration, allow the airpl airplane the very first time to go into a full on stall and then show the recovery. And her point was, and I tend to agree with it, is that that's starting too far into the program. Perhaps the best thing to do is that the moment that you hear the stall warning horn go off to teach the, teach the student to immediately reduce the angle of attack and apply power. Uh, and that, and if, and, and if people did that every time, they would never get into us. They would greatly reduce their ability to, the chance of getting into a full on stall condition and then work into scenarios where we allow the stall to develop further and further so as to demonstrate 
um, the effects of an actual complete wing stall. So I buy into that. And I know that when I do my next uh, stall training exercise, I will for sure spend, a, you know, 20 minutes with my student in the air, teaching them to instinctively reduce the angle of attack and apply power at the very first sign of a stall. Okay. And then once they get that into their head, that this is the correct and timely action to prevent a stall, then only, and only then should we go on further to show how a stall fully develops and then to start to branch off into the various types of stalls. And what, what are they? Well, okay, there's a straight on, well, it was power off, okay? Generally what we do is we just reduce power and have the uh, student try to keep the airplane at a certain altitude. And of course that requires increase and increase, increased back pressure and eventually the wing will stall we teach them to not allow a wing drop by using rudder control, not to use the ailerons, which can cause an incipient spin. And, and then once the airplane stalls, reduce the angle of attack and apply full power. Okay. So those would be basically everything under the arrival stall scenario. Um, the other types are the um, wings level climbing stall. Okay. Turning stalls. Okay cross control stalls, the departure stall um, with various power settings and flap settings. So it might be a slight right turn, full power, 20 degrees of flaps, and then just applying back pressure until the airplane starts to enter a stall condition. And so, yeah, so we basically, inc we, we kind of up the game over the program, you know, so that you've had the full on experience. But really, if you think about it, if you just react to an incipient stall you know every time by immediately reducing angle of attack leveling the wings with your feet and applying full power smoothly and uh, promptly then uh, you need never ever see in real life these other um, strengths of a stall condition occurring so i think it's really a good idea to sort of make people very aware that the sound of a stall horn is a big warning call and to uh, recover from that condition promptly and smoothly. And uh, yeah, so I think you should have a look at this stall spin awareness guide. Um, it talks about from a student's, from an instructor's perspective um, and how we can sort of apply the various scenarios like engine failure after takeoff, accelerated stalls, um, distractions, and the same goes with spins, um, uh, scenarios for the spin. And uh, there's even a little table at the end which sort of lays out the whole thing, stall scenario conditions, departure, divided into departure, arrival, and accelerated with different power settings, different aircraft configurations of flaps, with if it has retractable gear, either gear up or get gear down, and then attitude of the airplane, whether it's climbing, descending, if it's coordinated, uncoordinated, uh, turning left or turning right, and then combinations of all of these attitudes. So you can see it all, and then it tells you which page to go to to have a look at. So yeah, the stall spin scenario uh, guide is a, a private for private and commercial training. The latest edition, is October 2003, it's the second edition. And I highly recommend that you have a look at that. Um, I just wanna talk for a second about spins. Um, there's a lot of controversy about spin training. Um, when I was training for my private pilot license back in the very early 90s, um, we had to demonstrate as private pilots during the flight test how to initiate and recover from a full-on spin, or you could call it a late incipient spin. Um, so once the airplane has started spinning and is in that nose-down attitude, and then how to recover. And uh, for many of you, it's uh, kind of a big moment in your flight training. Um, and it's always the woo -hoo moment, you know, when talking with instructors, like, when are, are we doing spin training today? Or when are we doing spin training? And what's it going to be like? And am I going to get sick? And, you know, there's a lot of emphasis put on it. 
And I find that a bit of a bugaboo because really, I mean, if you can keep yourself from getting into a stall condition, the spin's not an issue. Um, so like, like the, uh, uh, like the philosophy of preventing stalls before they develop and teaching scenario based, because I think scenario based is really good, um, <clears throat> how to recognize incipient stalls and preventing them before they occur. Because face it, if your airplane is stall, stalling low to the ground, which is nine times out of 10 where it's going to happen, and if it gets into a full on stall, 99% of the time it's a fatal or tragic scenario. Um, so obviously, why wouldn't we put emphasis on just preventing stalls, okay, <clears throat> using various tactics? Well, the same thing goes for the spin. The spin often comes from the stall because you can't be in a spin unless, excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, so anyway, um, so the way I feel about it is, yeah, okay, i just show you how to recover from a spin. I mean, I guess it's great to know how to recover from a spin. But you're never going to have time in real life. I mean, if it happens, it's probably going to happen on the base to final turn or climbing out incipient spin from a, from a bad stall low to the ground. So in certain terms, it's kind of academic unless you're going to get into aerobatics. But anyway, there it is in the syllabus. I think the Americans have pretty well wiped it out of their syllabus. Um, um, but yet we still teach it. Now, we don't teach it in private. In private, we demonstrate and recover from a spin and talk about how the spin occurs. But in commercial training, we go into a full on, we get the students to do a full on developed spin and, uh, and recover from that. And it's on the flight test. Okay. Whether I agree with it or not is a moot point. But what I do have to say about that is that if you are in a condition where you're in a spin, you didn't do the first job. And the first job was to smoothly recover in a coordinated fashion from an incipient stall. And there's no reason, there's no good reason for an airplane to get into a full on stall and then result in spin because of uncoordinated flight. So, yeah, so that's how I feel about that. Um, so, I strongly urge you to have a look at the, uh, have a look at the stall spin awareness guide. I think it's really important. It's um, where a lot of the accidents come from in the departure and arrival and in the circuit scenario, arrivals and departures of airports, other than incursions, collisions between other aircraft. Uh, it's a big factor in, uh, in flight safety. And um, I don't know if we put the right emphasis on it as instructors in terms of in terms of what I was just talking about, I mean, how, how you should never really, you should be able to recognize and recover from a stall scenario automatically. And it's not some lesson that we just teach to show you how you can make an airplane fall out of the sky. It doesn't really fall, but uh, yeah, it's more than that, right? It's about, it's about saving lives and it's about airmanship and it's about, it's about good flying technique and it's about, um, dealing with the potentials for distraction, uh, which can be deadly. So yeah, there you go. There's my thoughts on the stall spin awareness guide. Uh, sorry if I was a little bit scattered. I tend to go into these videos ad lib. Um, I'm not much into writing notes. Um, I like to just sort of do it on the fly, uh, so to speak. Um, and I'm kind of prompted to add a video because some more people have joined my YouTube channel and my Mayday Flight Tutoring page. So I want to give you guys something. It's been a while since I posted anything. And it's sun starting to move away to the west. So it's a good time for me to uh, sign off. So until next time.